This is Art History 1, Part 8, the last phase of the Roman Empire. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, works like this one. This is, this is from around 380, and it's a portrait of a Roman emperor. But to show you how, how we got here, let's look at the beginning of the imperial period with uh, Caesar Augustus right at the start of the empire. Um, this, was the, this was the style for imperial portraiture. It has, uh, it's superficially Greek in the proportions of the figure and the, the pose, the contrapposto pose, and the, uh, the degree of naturalism and idealism that it has. But it's also Roman in that it's, he's wearing armor. It is a specific person doing something that, that associated with that person that is uh, in the uh, pose of oration. Uh, it also looks like him. It's made specifically to look like uh, Caesar Augustus, down to the locks of hair, are consistent through all his portraits to look, uh, be recognizable as him. It also has the ancestral worship with the symbolism on his chest and the symbolism of the uh, the Eros figure down at the bottom. And you know, so we have a combination of Greek things and Roman things in one portrait. The continuing on from there, some some time after this, about in the middle of the uh, uh, the 100s, maybe 176 or so. Uh, this is Marcus Aurelius, and, and they've continued with the same uh, type of portraiture. This is another another of, of the imperial portraits. It's, it has him on a horse, and it has the, you know, the horse looks like, you know, something from, from, from Greece, from Hellenistic Greece. The, uh, the way the, the drapery moves on the on the figure's chest is very similar to something from the Parthenon. Uh, it has the, the similar degrees of naturalism and idealism plus individualized portraiture uh, that, that we expected from, from the very beginning of the empire. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a, uh, a successful administrator of the empire, but it had, gone, it had gotten really big and it was very difficult to administer and it required a lot of a lot of skill to do that, uh, and then it, it started to decline pretty much after after Marcus Aurelius. Uh, his his son was uh, his name was Commodus, and here's a portrait of him. As far as portraiture goes, this is of, of is represents an, an increase in the in the degree of skill of of stone carving. Uh, it's 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 absolutely beautiful and 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 wonderfully balanced. It looks like it's floating. Uh, it has a wonderful uh, example of, of what you think of as the idealized Greek uh, physique, the naturalism in the hands and and all every every surface and material, the contrast between the girly hair and the smooth skin, uh, the lion skin. But it's a it's an image of a an emperor who. Is not especially serious. He wasn't good at, at, at being an emperor. Um, he's he's represented here, like playing the part of, of Hercules. That is, he's uh, he's wearing a costume as if he were Hercules, and that absence of seriousness and absence of of administrative skill is you know this for the beginning of the downfall of the of the empire. It didn't fall precipitously. It was very big. And it, and it and you know just a few bad emperors wouldn't have been a, a big deal, but uh, there was a bunch of chaos. Uh, and and after one emperor died, and then another was put up in its place by the by the military, uh, that that began a, a kind of decline where it's very difficult to get it back to the way it was. Caracalla, uh, the group of he's one of the group of emperors, uh, a family that came after. Uh, uh, Commodus before uh, was a military leader. He was somebody who, uh, you know, was was made the emperor, you know, by by the army, and then later he was killed himself uh, by somebody who who became emperor. So uh, this series of of turnovers based on on power and uh, military strength was a you know part of the struggling of the uh, of the end of uh, ending of the empire. But look at this type of portrait. 
it even though it's it's very different from the one before the other the, the one before was meant to be elegant and beautiful and this one is meant to be very serious and severe and powerful and intimidating yet it still has those those qualities that uh, all of the portraiture share in that you know a, a desire to be be naturalistic uh, proportioned like a real person to be individualized uh, all those things. It just happens that this individual is someone who was uh, severe and intimidating and wanted to show that in this in this imperial portrait. And this is in the in the in the middle of the two hundreds, uh, and from from that time to the three hundred, there was the succession of of, of, of of a precipitous decline in emperors until just before three hundred, Diocletian uh, finally stopped it. And, and put it more on a sound footing. But Diocletian had this idea that uh, the, the empire could best be run if it were divided into two, an east and a west. And he, uh, uh, after some time, he changed his mind and divided it into four, where there was a, uh, four quadrants of the empire, each one uh, run by, a, by its own leader. So. Uh, the four leaders would be called the tetrarchs, and the desire to do this was 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 so to try to try to administer the the, the vast size of the empire, uh, and also to try to make it so that it would be difficult to have all these problem successions uh, from from one emperor to another. What they would do is that of the four tetrarchs, two of them would be uh, a, a major figure. And the other, uh, the other two would be sort of minor figures. So, uh, in the West, there would be a major and a minor called Augustus or Augusti and a, uh, a Caesar. And the same thing would be in the East. And the uh, the Caesar would be the minor, and he would take the place of the of the major one uh, upon that that one's death. So that a succession, an orderly succession from one power to the next, would would work. But this was very short lived. But the thing about this. The tetrarch thing is that with this new form of government came a new uh, a new style. This is uh, an example of one of those, and the one I showed at the beginning. This one is another example, and I want to characterize these things before we get to the main ones, which will be these, which is the one on your list. But let's look at the uh, the individual portraits first. Uh, this is a tetrarch. Uh, and notice first that it, it looks very strange. The first thing you notice is the eyes. The eyes are not naturalistic eyes. They're like bug eyes or you know, cartoony kind of eyes. They don't look like you, they're, they're modeled after human beings, but it's to, to exaggerate the feature of eyes and sort of geometricize with this big arch at the top here and sort of almond shape, great big uh, pupils, circular pupils that, that stare out really, really weirdly. The... Uh, um, the brow is knit, but it's knit in not a way that, a naturalistic way, but an exaggerated uh, caricature kind of way. The the hair is represented with just a chiseling that, to create a, a, a pattern along to a different textural pattern for the bearded area and the hair area. I mean, when you look at the kind of skill of wood car of, of, of stone carving here for hair, that the uh, Roman portrait uh, portrait carvers were, were were very good at this, and they knew how to do this. And this was a, a highly skilled thing. And whoever made this was showing off that skill. But even when they would do something like this, where you have a beard that is very very short, it still has a, a naturalistic look to it, like it's trying to trying to show the way something looks in nature. That's not going on here. This is very abstracted. When we look at this, uh, the, the face is even more extreme in terms of being removed from reality. It's not meant to be a portrait of a specific person, but of a, a, an emperor type. Uh, I think the, uh, the idea was to, to remove the, the personality of the emperor and turn it into um, just a, a figurehead kind of thing that anyone could, uh, could, could fit into those shoes. Look at, for example, this brow. How the brow comes down and has this ridge right here between this plane and this plane. That that's, This is not the way people look. 
uh, the eyes, the way they don't look like um, spheres inset into a, a hollow, the way eyes are. They're, they're, there's just this surface ridge that creates this shape, you know, just like you would draw an eye uh, with, a, with a magic marker and, and just make, a, make an almond shape and then a circle inside and another circle inside that. Uh, you know, that's, that's um, very far removed from nature. Now the rest of the face, you know, the, the smoothness, the roundness, the little little indentation here, indentation here, you know, this kind of looks like, like normal portraiture, but when you look at these, like the, the edge of the hair, which is what this is, um, the, the odd proportion of, of this part of the jaw in relationship to the rest of the face, this is, this is you know, far removed from the naturalism that we, we come to expect. From, from imperial portraiture or any kind of uh, uh, stone carving that we've seen before from either the Romans or the Greeks. Uh, so that's, this is what I'm, I'm going to be calling the Tetrarch style. This is this, the style that is introduced at this period to represent uh, the, the emperors during this very brief period, just before 300, and uh, uh, even though that, that government style was short-lived, the style itself um, continued to go on long after. Uh, we're going to look at the the work that's on your list. It's called the Four Tetrarchs, and they are um, this group of, of figures that are attached to this church. This is Saint Mark's in Venice, and the reason that they happen to be here is because uh, a circumstance that occurred later when um, the Christians, you know, uh, attacked. Constantinople and, and brought back the spoils of war, and one of the things they brought was the representation of the emperors uh, from long before, and they attached them to this church. Um, this is this is a medieval thing, but uh, where they got them, it was some some place in Constantinople where the, the the tetrarchs had been represented, and we're going to look at this the way they're represented um, from that from that time period. These are four figures. It's been broken in half and put on a corner of a building, but they were originally four side by side. Uh, they're in pairs. Each tetrarch uh, was paired with you know, two of them together here, two of them together here. They, uh, one has the arm on the other one's shoulder. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, there's a, there's a major and a minor uh, for every pair. So the one that is the major is the one putting the arm on the minor one. And the major one also has a kind of a beard texture here, and the, and the minor one doesn't. Same with these, this pair. But we're going to look at this style, and uh, see that the significance of this style isn't so much this particular piece, but it's 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 in that this style is going to be uh, is going to continue on for hundreds and hundreds of years. This will be a style that will come back to so many different times in so many different ways. Uh, because it, when the when the later when the Christians, the early Christians started making their art, many times they will look to this style rather than to the classical style. So let's look at this. What characterizes this style? Similar to the portrait itself, uh, though the two portraits we saw before, um, the the heads are similar in that they are the the faces have these weird eyes. Kind of almond-shaped eyes with the with the circular uh, little ridge to indicate the iris, and a little surgical uh, circular ridge to indicate the pupil with a little dot drilled out the middle. Uh, so they're they're wide-eyed and staring, and the the sort of artificial knit brow, and the texture for the beard, and the sort of just general oddness in the face that's not naturalistic. The size of the head in relationship to the body. Is kind of large. Look, they look kind of like dolls rather than people. The fact that the the clothing that they wear, this is you know their emperor, so they're wearing armor similar to what uh, Augustus was wearing in that original portrait that I showed at the beginning. But in this case, you don't see the the figure underneath, and that will be a, a something that's consistent uh, throughout this in the uses of this style is that you don't see the figure underneath when you look back. At the classical style, the fact that there's a figure underneath that 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 it that is in proportion, and it's uh, and the the artist understood 
how bones and, and muscles work and how the balance of the body works and all of its you know related parts and how it how it feels how it moves all these things were things that the, the artists in the past had studied but all that's kind of thrown away in this style where the figures themselves are just are just amorphous shapes with a, a kind of a almost like doll clothes on them to, to represent to, to represent the, the the armor that the emperor would wear and the they're characterized by this patterning uh, the shoulder epaulets whatever these are are uh, are just a bunch of grooves the, the the thing that represents the sleeve uh, this is sort of cloth you remember how cloth is represented in in uh, in classical style that the art it would look like the artist had looked at cloth uh, on a person's body and seen that some places it touches and you can see the the form of the body underneath and sometimes it creates wrinkles and you know all the kinds of different things that cloth do and this is not like that at all this is just um, grooves in the in the surface to sort of give a, a kind of a kind of impression of what uh, of what cloth would do uh, now you can sort of read it as cloth but in the way that you could read you know a doll's clothes as real clothes uh, the, the the way the cloak around the shoulders and that's going down the side here this 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 is an abstraction of the way cloth works. This sort of uh, patterning here, this little circle here, the triangle here, are are kind of you know abstractions from uh, you know not looking at cloth, but looking at representations of cloth and sort of pulling out a few shapes, but not things that that give the impression that anyone looked at cloth for this. Um, all the parts of the uniform, the, this, this belt, this thing here with the circles, are just different kinds of patterns. And that will be a consistent thing among uh, other, other examples of this style from now on, is the emphasis on pattern as opposed to the underlying structure. Like if you don't see the figure underneath it, you just see the pattern on the surface. And in here, this, the pattern is made, because this is made out of you know, a hard stone called porphyry, it's actually a very rare uh, purple kind of, of porphyry, only used for emperors. But, um, you know, so it doesn't have color to it. So the, instead of color, they, they put all this textural pattern throughout. Um, to, to emphasize surfaces. And thematically, what's going on is that they want... Uh, they want to show the unity between two um, between two rulers by creating a, a kind of a making one one object out of two people. You know this arch that goes right here. You know makes it look like it's one shape, and having this arm come across here um, sort of cements them together. And making them have exactly the same pose with with their left hands holding the hilt of identical swords or sword hilts within sheaths. Uh, all of this is to make them look like they're one body, too, uh, because they, the whole business of the, the, the Tetrarchs was to try to um, you know, unify the empire after, after, lots of, after lots of problems. And one of the big problems was disunity, where you know, you know, different people would vie for being, for being the leader, and, and they would kill one another over it. So uh, they want to show unity. Okay, let's look at a, another instance. Um, this is the Arch of Constantine uh, in the 300s. Uh, after, after the Tetrarchs and the disaster of that, uh, one of the Tetrarchs was uh, Constantine's father. And uh, once he died, Constantine, Constantine took his place and then uh, spent time defeating the others until he was the lone emperor again and united the empire under a single under single administration. And he made this, this triumphal arch in order to, um, to commemorate one of his battles, one of the decisive battles in that effort. What we're going to be looking at is the, 
the sculpture that was put on this. Now this was made in a hurry and they didn't have the time to carve lots and lots of new stuff. So many of the things on this, this arch were taken from other places. The, you know, monuments for other emperors from the past, like these two, they were going to look at a close bit, close up of, uh, of this area right here. Uh, these two roundels are, are images taken from a, a monument to Emperor Hadrian. Uh, this part, this rectangle at the bottom, is, uh, uh, is new to the, to the monument, and this commemorates Constantine. Uh, what, what he did was he had these things removed and that, that, that were to commemorate some, some special thing about the Emperor Hadrian, and had them recarve the head. This is head here. Was, was originally Hadrian, and they changed it to make it look more like Constantine. The head over here also was made to look more like Constantine. Otherwise, these are in the classical style. But the stuff that was carved newly for this monument are, is this row of figures down here, which shows uh, a group of people here, uh, and there's a big sort of dais to raised platform. Uh, the Emperor Constantine is the one here with a cloak, and is missing his head, somebody in the intervening years decided to remove the head. But the, the rest of the, it would have been just like all these other heads. Notice they don't have any kind of individualism to them either. Um, the figures are, well, let's look at another version of it. Notice the, the characteristics of the, that we saw as the Tetrarch style before of doll-like figures, large heads, uh, clothing that, that sort of masks the form of the body underneath, and the drapery style, in this case, it's just little grooves on the surface um, that, that don't mat are not naturalistic. Otherwise, this is some sort of like the uh, Arapacus, where you have just a group of figures wearing togas standing next to each other, and there's even a young person there. Uh, but the, but the, the, the representational style is vastly different. Uh, as I said, all the, the Tetrarch characteristics are embodied in this in this kind of little doll-like figures. Notice that the figures in the background are raised above the ones here, so that um, it looks very two-dimensional. It's not it's not like uh, when when we saw instances of of the classical style where you have a group of people, some in front and some behind. The one behind would be. Uh, you know, you would see them between, and they would be reduced in uh, in their in their carving, so as to make it look as though they're they're uh, farther away. Here, they're above, and so that creates the whole two dimensional effect more so than a three dimensional effect uh, that we had in the classicizing phase. In this in this style, uh, Constantine is standing here. Uh, he's kind of disconcerting, not having a head there, but. Uh, otherwise, you have a gr group of people all in as weird proportions, you know, just, 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 just all out of whack. They look uh, very truncated in their in their stances. This is a standing man with a head here, and with the, this is the width of the shoulders, and this is how tall he is with his feet sticking out the bottom. Apparently, that's not a not a problem for them. Look at also the the architecture in the background. These capitals and columns here. There's some arches back here, uh, other columns. Uh, they don't have a ki the kind of exactness that you would expect something made by a Roman by, by the, in, in the classicizing period. Uh, they, they look almost like they're sort of sketchy. The whole thing kind of has a, there's another image of it. You know, doesn't look like it, the, it, it is at all in the, the standard that, that you'd come to expect from the, from the previous types of works. But the thing is, you, you know, one, one's, one's initial response to something like this is, well, well, maybe they lost the ability. Maybe these are people who, who were able to, who didn't have that, that training or were, weren't able to carve anything better, so it looks almost like, a, like child drawings uh, as opposed to, you know, the complete artistically highly skilled things from, from the past. But you have to understand that the, the same people who did this also were able to recarve this head and this head to look like it belonged to, to these pieces. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the people who carved this could have carved this had they had time, uh, images in the classical style. 
This type of rendering is something that was deliberate, not, not the result of an absence of skill, but they wanted this style because this was, uh, you know, the modern thing. This is what they, what they thought of as being, you know, the, a new progressive style, whereas this, is, this would be old-fashioned. And if they wanted to carve something old in an old-fashioned manner, they could. You know, this, you know, this looks like Constantine, and it looks like a portrait of Constantine from, from that period. In fact, we have, they were able to do uh, an image of Constantine like this. This is a part of a, a colossal statue of Constantine made for uh, a basilica where he would be seated under an arch uh, in the style of a, a Roman emperor, the way they were sitting on a throne. And, and, but it's but of, a, of a much larger scale. Uh, the reason we have just the head and the arm and pieces like this is because uh, originally this was going to be a, a, a multimedia piece with with uh, uh, there would be a wooden structure representing the body, and it would be covered with sheets of bronze representing the the, the cloth. And we don't have that. In fact, there's even an image of that. There's just the, the marble pieces that are left, and the pieces of the marble would be his, his head, um, his arms, and I think his legs, and even I think there's a foot remaining, and there's his hand. Um, but the the style of the of the head. Is, uh, is very similar to what we saw with the Tetrarch style, that is the huge eyes, the sort of geom geometricizing of, of this, this sort of lid going into an arch here and then another arch and then another arch here. Uh, it's a little more naturalistic than, than that first one we saw, that sort of reddish one. But this one is still uh, very far removed from, from the reality of the way people look, just the, the proportions of his, his face size of his forehead, this, this little cap-like hair, uh, the huge jaw. These are, these are characteristics. If we look back, you know, this, this sort of big jaw here that he has, and that cap-like hair, the cap here, and also the cap that, of hair that you know, everybody seems to have here. Um, so the, 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 it, it is a style. It's just a, a deliberately chosen style to, to represent emperors. And you know, if it had just come and gone, you know, that would be a, you know, just 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 an anomaly, sort of like uh, the Amarna period in Egypt, where a different style came and then went, you know, within, you know, just a just a generation. But the thing is that uh, we're, we'll see this come up again and again and again. Now, you know, this is we're still in the in the three hundreds uh, when when these things are made. Uh, so Constantine was, was you know, he reign, reigned for a long time. And during the course of his reign, he was able to, uh, to end the persecution of the Christians. And uh, many of the, the early Christian, you know, uh, monuments are going to come from during the time of his reign, especially uh, St. Peter's, which we'll see shortly. Uh, he, uh, here, let's look at the next work. This is in, an ivory from around 400. Uh, I wanted to show you this to, to, to let you understand that the, the, the skill of representing the classical style still existed. There were still people who were still able to do this sort of thing, even during this, the, the, what I'm calling the Tetrarch style, uh, to further you know, emphasize the point that it, that Tetrarch style is a deliberate choice, not something that is a, a, an example of a lack of skill. So it, it, this this is uh, another piece that's going to be on your list, and this is a a representation a representation of a a priestess at an altar sacrificing, making a sacrifice. There's a little a little uh, a boy here holding a, a bowl with um, some sort of fruit in it, and a, a ewer with liquid in it, and the uh, priestess is doing whatever you do in, over an altar to. Uh, to make some sort of sacrifice. But the representation of the figure we see is classical. You can see the figure underneath. You can see that the, the, the cloth that she's wearing, this toga that she's wearing, is, is draped naturalistically and, and beautifully. I mean, it's the, 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 uh, the, the drapery falls normally with gravity, and it makes these pleats and cascades and arabesques and, and all these things that 
that you know we recognize as as the way cloth actually moves, and it and it's a beautiful thing. And it's to to see that sort of thing. It requires a great deal of skill to do this, and so that the skill wasn't lost during that the the Tetrarch period. Even the uh, classical contrapposto, even though we're seeing this figure from the side, you can tell that one fig, one foot here is engaged, has the, the weight on it, and the other is sticking out here, uh, the free leg. Uh, classical face, and also the pattern around here is, is also from the classical period, Roman letters. Um, so this thing, is, is, a, is a good and clear example that even, even after a century of that Tetrarch style, that there were people who could still do this. Uh, the, this item that we're looking at is, uh, is part of a diptych, and it was it two things like this that closed together in a kind of a very shallow box. Inside the box would be a place where you, uh, a little tray that has wax in it that would be smooth, flat, and uh, you could write in it with a stylus. And you would uh, write a message to someone and give it to the servant. The servant take it to the to the person the the message goes to, and the person could read the message, uh, smooth it out, and write a reply. And so you could uh, communicate one with each other for people who were rich enough to own such a such a precious precious object. Okay, so that's um, sculptural representation for for the the period of the of the three hundreds. And we're going to look now at the architecture. This is a basilica at Trier. Trier was one of the places where the capital for the empire was going to be when it was divided into four parts. Uh, the other parts were, were you know, down in Rome and then Constantinople. I think there was one in Greece. And, and so that you know the different parts of the empire could be administered from, from different places. This is the one that's sort of in the north, uh, sort of in northern Europe one. And uh, this is a, a basilica, and we're going to be looking at basilicas uh, because they are important for, for later, for, for the churches. Now, when, when Constantine uh, ended the persecution of the, of the Christians, the Christians were able to you know, become mainstream, and uh, they started building churches. And when they needed to build churches, they, you know, they looked around for models for what kind of building they're going to use as a as a sample of of uh, to make a church and, and the the Roman and the Greek temples were not appropriate because the churches needed a particular type of of, of building for their for the liturgy and for to do all of the the uh, um, to perform all the sacraments uh, within the church and to, to, to do all the things that they needed they needed something more like a barn a great big open space uh, that was covered, that you, a lot of people could come inside. And the Roman tent buildings like that, but they weren't for, for religious purposes. They were secular buildings, usually for, for courts or for audience halls, for uh, shopping malls. I mean, they were called basilicas. And this is a very simple one. Um, it's just a box. It's, it's ground plan. It's just a, a rectangle. It goes up about 100 feet, has two rows of, of arched windows on the side, and, uh, and at the end, it has this uh, half of a cylinder shape it's called an apse. And we'll see a lot of those as we, as we move on, because once the, the, uh, uh, the Christians took hold of this idea of a basilica and started making churches out of it, then they would have different uses for this than what the emperors had them for. In this case, let's look at this is what this building looks like now. It hasn't changed much. Uh, from this 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 model with this of what it used to look like, but that's that's the way it is. It was built by the Romans. It's made of brick on the outside. This is what apparently what it was looked like looking like on the outside, but on the inside it it would had uh, marble and things, sort of like the the uh, the Pantheon would have lots of lots of special marble and stuff on the inside. But the way the way it works is that. The, when this was originally made, there would be a throne here, and the, the emperor would sit here, uh, Constantine's father originally when this was built, and then Constantine would, would be down here. Notice it has a cross here, because it has since been turned into a Christian church. But before it was a Christian church, it was designed to be uh, a place, an audience hall for the emperor. And 
the way it's designed is that when you come in from, from the point of view that this photograph was taken, when you come into the door side and you look in and you see this row of windows going, going down in perspective, like these, these rows here, they all point to this end, this apse end. The apse is this half of a cylinder uh, in, the, in the back and it has a big arch over it. So when you have something underneath an arch, it makes it look uh, the thing under the arch more special to be under an arch and to be in this apse, uh, this recessed area, you know, makes makes things special. And having every all the lines point to it makes it, makes it special. So you can see how, you know, the, the Christians would look at that and say, if we just replace where the emperor goes with an altar, um, then the, the specialness that is created by all the, the architectural design will go towards the, the altar and the priest performing the the Eucharist at the end of the at the end of the building. Another little trick that they've got going on here is that the, these windows, all these windows are the same size over here, but when they get to the apse, the, in, the, the apse, obsidial windows are smaller, but they look like they should be the same size. And what, what's going on is that because you expect them to be the same size, when you see them uh, in this in the in this context you interpret these to be the same size as this, and because they're smaller, it makes them look like they're farther away. And if you have something here that is normal size, like an emperor on a throne, it gives the illusion, or you misinterpret it, as if the, the person is bigger than they really are. That's just uh, uh, one of those little eye tricks that they, that they could do. Uh, and we'll, we'll see examples of that later. But anyway, that, that same sort of uh, illusion thing that goes on uh, to make the emperor look special would also make the, the altar look special. Um, but as I said, this is a this is a, a simple version of a basilica. I also want to show you what a complex version is because this will be um, many of the churches that we're going to see later are going to be based on this kind of basilica. This is uh, one called Ulpia. Uh, in the Roman Forum, and this has that the characteristic of, of having the apse here and the great big open space in the middle, but it also has uh, a colonnade, and that's, here's an in interior. Uh, this colonnade is going to be also something that the uh, Christian churches will, will incorporate into churches. Here you can't really see the apse back here. I think on this one the apse was, was on this end. We'll, help, we'll see, a, see there's a, an apse on either end here. And it also had this, the entire uh, basilica complex would have um, all sorts of other stuff. And I'm, I'm showing you this is because when we see the first big Christian church, the old St. Peter's, it will also take many of these things into, into account. This is a cross section of that basilica. And notice that, that, it, that it has a great big open space in the middle here when it has aisles on either side. And this, this will be uh, directly copied into the, the Christian church that we're going to look at next. It's called Old St. Peter's. Notice has, this is called the basilican structure. That is, it, it, it takes the form of basilica in that it has a big open space in the middle with not, not, not nearly as tall aisles on either side. And it has a colonnade. It has uh, a big area of wall that's devoted to pictures here. And it also has uh, windows up at the top. I believe the, uh, uh, the basilica also had windows up here. But the way the, the Christians uh, made this was to have you know, a roof over the middle part and then a roof over the side parts. And between these two would be the row of windows called the clerestory. So the clerestory zone, and then this zone with the pictures, and then the, the uh, colonnade down here plus the aisles, plus the apse, you know, that makes up the, the basilican structure. There's one other little part we're going to look at here, which is the transept. This is a ground plan of this, this part here, is a ground plan of this, the major part of this building. And this area here is an area that is uh, transverse to the nave, and it goes the, the width of the building, and it... Uh, um, it is the height of the nave, and this creates a cross-like shape. 
uh, for the symbol of the cross. It also they it, they use the the transept for different things. Some it's just extra floor space, and others times it's for um, special, like pilgrims can come in from one door and go through uh, during during ceremonies and things that it can be used for, you know, various things in different churches. Here you can see the the elevation of the transept there, so it's to make a cross like shape. In later Christian churches, uh, this this extended part here, uh, the apse where the altar is, is is stretched out further, so as to make something even more like a cross shape. Um, this box that is the building is attached to another area here, an atrium area. There's a fountain here in the middle. There's the gatehouse over here. All of these things are um, are characteristic of just the earliest churches. They didn't they didn't continue this on. For all churches, here's a uh, a drawing of what the whole thing would have looked like. But you can see how they they took many of the characteristics of the the layout of the basilica, an entire uh, forum area, in order to um, because they needed these things for 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 the Christian church. Here's a picture of a church that was made at a similar. You know, a little bit after the the old St. Peter's, it has the kind of the look of what the old one would have looked like. Uh, it has area for uh, pictures up here above between the colonnade and the uh, and the in the clear story with the windows. It's very elaborately decorated with a flat roof or a flat ceiling here, and has mosaics everywhere. The uh, uh, the apse uh, has a has a a uh, half of a dome on top of it, uh, so as to have an opportunity with to show, you know, the images in mosaic form on the, on the back side there. All right, so so this is going to be the form of the church. This is this is much smaller than than Old Saint Peter's was. Old Saint Peter's apparently was was a much longer. It was the largest thing uh, because it was the first one. It was made to go over the tomb of Saint Peter, and it was the uh, the Pope's Church. Here's a drawing, late, made probably in the 1400s, of what it looked like, pretty much close to the time with the, that they that they uh, destroyed it, so as to make the new Saint Peter's. And when we get to the uh, the 1500s, we'll see the circumstances of making new Saint Peter's and and uh, the kind of architectural style that that they replaced it with. But until that happened, this this survived for uh, maybe twelve centuries of of constant use, and and uh, you know it was, a, it was a big wonderful thing, and and we have a f only a few instances still in existence of what it what it would have looked like. Here's a here's a three D model of it. Uh, notice that the the colonnade here is made up of different colored marble columns. These were probably taken from 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 Roman buildings, uh, so as to you know to, to, to emphasize that they are replacing the Roman Empire and you know reusing its parts uh, for for their own purposes. Here's an example of the style of of uh, mosaics that would have been in a a building like like Old St. Peter's. This this color here, those kind of brown, is actually uh, gold. And you know, gold doesn't photograph well, but in a in a place that's lit by candles, gold like this would glitter, and everything the surfaces of everything would look like uh, like a treasure, and so this would become um, more like uh, uh, the city of God, which is what what a church is is supposed to represent. All right, so that's architecture. Let's look at uh, later in this century, in the three hundreds, the uh, uh, a sarcophagus of, a, of someone named Junius Bassus, and this this is going to be, um, you know, the kind of style that we're going to see most of. It's just is a kind of a blending between the Tetrarch style and the uh, and, and and the classical style. This is a, a sarcophagus, which is a big coffin made out of uh, made out of marble, and this was uh, one of the early Christians. This is the person named Junius Bassus. This Bassus is right there. Uh, carved in the and the uh, the top of the entablature, it says he was forty. He's forty two years old when he died. 
So uh, what we see here carved on, on, the, on the side of this sarcophagus is a whole bunch of scenes, uh, 10 scenes, and they're divided by architectural you know, columns and tablatures, some gable ends, some arches here, uh, with lots and lots of patterns, you know, filling, filling every space. Uh, to have these little scenes to to represent Christian you know, stories of, of the Christian story, uh, Christ in the center here, seated as an emperor, uh, with his uh, apostles on either side, and Christ entering Jerusalem uh, on the donkey, uh, and and notice that there's it's almost like a little little plays like theatrical scenes with with actors filling up just the the full area of the space that each provides, and just enough uh, information to tell what's going on. This, I think, is the, the arrest of St. Peter. Uh, this is the sacrifice of Isaac with, with uh, Abraham here and Isaac down here. Uh, there's a blade in his hand. So all, each one is a story to being told as, as simply and clearly as you, can, as you can make it within this small space. Um, this is Christ before Pilate. There's, there's Pilate. Uh, he's going to wash his hands of the affair, uh, and and you know this scene takes over is 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 made over two uh, two of the spaces. Down here is Daniel in the lion's den, where you know one figure of Daniel, two lions is enough to tell that whole story. This is the rest of Paul. This is Adam and Eve, and Job. So, you know. Several stories from the Bible, from the from the some from the Old Testament, some from the from the New Testament, um, are are all, all put here into this this uh, very cramped space. And everybody is 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 filling up all the spaces and all the the extra spaces, the 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 borders and the and the divisions are all filled with architectural things with lots and lots of patterns. Look at the the columns have little little babies on them there. Uh, there with vines and stuff going on, uh, spiral columns, uh, lots and lots of stuff everywhere. All these things are, you know, beaten reels and acanthus leaf moldings, uh, just to just to, you know, liven up the thing with pattern. And as we saw before, the the uh, part part of the. Uh, uh, the Tetrarch style was an emphasis on patterns, and 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 we'll see lots of instances of that uh, later for things that are influenced by that. Um, the way the figures are characterized, you can see here. Like here's a disc is a good example. When you look at this in relationship to the classical style, well, it does have contrapposto. There's an engaged leg and a free leg, and the knee sort of poking through. Um, the 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 head is kind of classicized. And the fact that he's wearing a toga. All these things are, are classical things. It, but it doesn't have the it doesn't have the classical proportions. Uh, the head is too big, it still looks like a doll. It's uh, it doesn't seem to be standing at least upright, you know, like it doesn't doesn't have a clear indication of the weight of the body being on, on its on its feet. Um, all of the figures have a kind of a classicizing look to them, but they're they're Far removed from it, they're they're moved in the direction of being little doll-like figures rather than massive, you know, huge heroic figures that you come to expect from the classical style. And and so we'll, what we're going to see is that this this style, this is you know, part classical, part tetrarch. Uh, style are, are going to reappear over and over in different degrees. That is, sometimes you're going to see places where uh, where artists will will try to reproduce the classical style as close as they can. Other times it'll be much more like the Tetrarch style, but it's it's going to be one or the other or some blending between the two for pretty much everything that's going to occur during the the uh, the Middle Ages. Okay, that's enough for for this time.